Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Bob Custer, president of Boise State University. It's nice to see you with us this evening. I think I must reassure you, however, with all these flowers, we have not come to bury Caesar this evening. I'm not so sure we've come to praise him, having read at least one of Judge Napolitano's books. But uh, nonetheless, we're just delighted that you're here for what is going to be a very exciting evening. I would like to take this time to introduce our hosts for this evening, Governor Butch Otter, the governor of the great state of Idaho. Mayor David, please. <laughs> Mayor David Beter, city of Boise. I don't see Dave here. Don Brandt, trustee of the Brandt Foundation, president of the Brandt Agency. <laughs> Larry Williams, owner of Treetop. Where's Larry? Is Larry here? Larry and Mary Ann are, they're supposed to be up here wherever they are. Alan Noble, owner and CEO, Farm Development Corporation and Idaho Helicopter. Pat McMurray, president and CEO, Wells Fargo. Jerry Hess, trustee of the Brandt Foundation and the new chairman of the College of Southwestern Idaho, College of Western Idaho, and Howard Smith, Vice President of University Advancement here. And Howard, you have a place up here too, but that's fine. We have some members of the, of the legislature and the judiciary with us this evening, and I would like to begin by introducing Supreme Court Justice Daniel Eisman. Justice Eisman. <laughs> Senator Patty Ann Lodge has joined us tonight. State Representative Raul Labrador. There he is. Representative Pete Nielsen is on his way to a meeting up in Garden Valley. Representative Steve Thane is with us this evening. Representative Carlos Bilbao is here. There he is. And Representative Fred Wood. Where are you? There he is. Great to have you with us tonight, gentlemen and ladies. Uh, there will be a book signing after the lecture. That'll be in the Bishop Barnwell room. Books are available in the lobby, and please take a moment, if you will, to silence your cell phones. That's really the reason they have me up here, is to get those cell phones silenced. Now, we're going to deviate from the program just a bit uh, this year. We have had a unique and wonderful opportunity with Governor Butch Otter in attendance. Uh, when I interviewed Judge Napolitano last week f as a precursor to this event, uh, he said there were 50 governors in, this, in the states, but there was really only one that knew how to read the United States Constitution and interpret it appropriately. And that was Governor Butch Otter. And uh, he said, boy, I'd be honored if he were to introduce me this evening. So that's what's going to happen uh, tonight. But in the meantime, before we get to that, I'd like to introduce to you our Brandt Professor of Free Enterprise Capitalism. The Brandt professorship was the first named professorship created for a faculty member at Boise State. We are fortunate to have filled that position with the very talented Dr. Charlotte Twight. Dr. Twight received both her Juris Doctorate and her PhD at the University of Washington. She is an expert in government regulation of the U.S. economy. Her research explores public choice, institutional change, and the growth of government. She has been here at Boise State since 1986 and was named the Brandt Professor in 2003. Since that time, she has been responsible for pulling together the Brandt Foundation Lecture Series, and she has done an extraordinary job. This year, of course, is no exception, and frankly, my bet is that this is the best lecture you will see yet. Please join me in thanking Charlotte for all of her hard work in bringing us together. Let's bring Charlotte to the podium. Good evening. It is an honor for me to thank the Brandt Foundation and its trustees for making this wonderful evening a rea reality. I want to express my deep gratitude to John and Ora Brandt, whose extraordinary lives and commitment to their community, described in tonight's program, continue to make such significant contributions to the people of Idaho. It is the generosity of the John H. and Ora I. Brandt Foundation that has made possible not only tonight's lecture, 
but all of the Brandt Foundation lectures we have enjoyed and will continue to enjoy at Boise State University. On behalf of our university, I also wish to thank the trustees of the Brandt Foundation. They are Don Brandt, president of the Brandt Agency, Lawrence Gray, a longtime Nampa farmer who is active in many community organizations, Jerry Hess, chairman of the Board of Trustees of the New College of Western Idaho and president and CEO of J.M. Hess Construction, J.R. Schiller, attorney and state court judge for over 12 years, and Dan Sims, an owner of the Sims Fruit Ranch. Will the trustees please stand so that we can express our appreciation? Thank you. Boise State University and the College of Business and Economics are extremely grateful to the Brandt Foundation for its creation of the first name professorship for a tenured faculty member at BSU and for making this lecture series possible. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Governor Butch Otter, governor of the great state of Idaho, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Governor Otter. Well, thank you, and thank you for that warm welcome. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce uh, this evening's speaker, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Judge Nap Napolitano earned his law degree from the University of Notre Dame and his undergraduate, undergraduate degree from Princeton. Judge Napolitano has written widely on the Constitution and the growth of government, including two books, Constitutional Chaos and The Constitution in Exile. Some of his most formative experiences occurred while serving as a superior court judge in New Jersey, where he became the youngest life-tenured superior court judge in the state's history. Because Judge Napolitano grew up with a strong feeling of respect for authority, as a judge, he was dismayed to find that officials' responsibility for enforcing the law often violated it themselves. In Constitutional Chaos, he wrote, quote, the effect of my professional intimacy with the system was a sea change in my thinking. Seeing, studying, and examining the events described day after day eventually caused me to rethink the vagaries that have been literally a part of my soul since I matured into a thinking adult, unquote. This sea change in his thinking led, amongst other things, to a new book entitled the Constitution in Exile, how the federal government has seized power by rewriting the supreme law of the land. He dedicated this book to President Thomas Jefferson, who in Judge Napolitano's words, alone amongst the presidents allowed tyrannical laws to expire, and who reminded posterity that when the people fear the government, there is tyranny. When the government fears the people, there is liberty. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Judge Andrew Napolitano. And you picked my favorite quotes from the book. Thank you, Governor. Governor Butch Otter is unique among his colleagues, I know this because I know him professionally from when he was a member of the House of Representatives. He truly understands the Constitution and understands the limited role that government was intended to play in our lives. You are many, many times blessed to have a man of his understanding at the head of the executive branch here in the great state, I should say in Bronco Nation. I think I was on the bench about two or three weeks uh, when they assign you small claims. You come out in the courtroom, there's about this many people in the courtroom. You have to get rid of all of their cases before lunch because after lunch there's going to be this many people yet again. A typical case is the dry cleaner ruined my dress but he also tried to pick up my sister. 
So a lawyer comes up to me and he says, Your Honor, we're going to need a translator for this particular case. I said, what's the language? He said, Italian. So I called the courthouse administrator to get the Italian translator. She was involved in another case. And I said to the throng in the courtroom, is there anybody here that speaks Italian? A little guy in the back raises his hand. He comes up and said, come on up, sir. He sits down. We swear in the translator to translate truthfully. We swear in the witness to answer questions truthfully. And here's literally exactly what happens. Lawyer to translator. Give the court your name. Translator to witness. What is your name? <laughs> what the heck kind of a translation is that? Let me see where this is going to go. <laughs> Lawyer to translator. Give the court your address. Translator to witness. Where is it you house? I looked at this guy, I thought you said that you could translate. I thought you said that you could speak Italian. He said, I can, Your Honor, but my English is she's not is so good. <laughs> One time I'm picking a jury in New Jersey uh, state courts, as in the federal courts, as you may know, the judge actually picks the jury. That is, he or she interrogates a large group of people, again, about this size, trying to find 12 people that have no bias or prejudice or interest in the outcome and can truly and fairly judge the case. So I'm interrogating these people to see if they have any biases and I say to the crowd, is there anybody here that can't be on this jury? Woman raised her hand, she said, judge, I can't be on the jury because of my occupation. Now this was a, a guy being uh, prosecuted for distribution of drugs, so I thought, what could her occupation possibly be? that would keep her off this jury. So I said, all right, madam, what do you do? She said, I'm a soothsayer. Well, who calls themselves a soothsayer in 1997, which is when this was happening? So I fall for it. I said, all right, madam, uh, how does that keep you from being on the jury? She said, judge, I already know how the case ends up. <laughs> I should have said, lady, tell us and save us the next three weeks in the courtroom. One time I was trying a case, Here, here's the law, when the police stop you for speeding or having a broken taillight or whatever the reason is for the stop, they are permitted to pat you down for weapons. And if they believe that you have a weapon on you, they can reach into your pocket and remove what they think is the weapon. So this police officer was testifying that he stopped this young man and he patted him down and the guy had in his pocket a brick. Oh, come on, who walks around with a brick in their pocket? Judge, it was a brick. I reached into his pocket, pulled it out, turned out it was a brick of cocaine. So I said, do you mean to tell me that this container of cocaine appeared to you to be a brick? He said, yes, I do, Your Honor. I said to the clerk, bring me the bag of cocaine. I was a little nervous at this point. The clerk brings me a plastic bag of cocaine. I said, the record will reflect that the judge is holding the bag of cocaine to squeeze it to see if it feels like a brick. I squeeze the bag of cocaine, the bag breaks. <laughs> the cocaine is all over the place, including on my hair, my eyelashes, and my black robe. Now, nobody knows what to do at this point. Thank goodness for life tenured appointment to the bench. I say, ladies and gentlemen, only in America can a black robe judge sit in a public courtroom covered with cocaine with impunity. <laughs> they, of course, come out with vacuum cleaners and vacuum it up, and I changed uh, robes, and the guy was acquitted because I didn't buy this brick nonsense. Anyway, to matters more relevant to uh, what we're here to talk about, and I, I am deeply grateful for the opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you uh, about the Constitution and about its role in our lives. Permit, if you will, a little bit of a history lesson. It won't be too long, and it'll bring us to the problems that we as a, as a society face today. The creation of the American Republic, with its written Constitution and guarantees of natural liberty is the greatest political accomplishment in the history of the Western world.
unfortunately, that accomplishment was short-lived. Recall, if you will, when we were colonies and the King of England was the government and the Parliament of England was the government and they wanted money from the colonists. So one of the ingenious ways that the Parliament and the King raised money was the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act required that every adult colonist purchase a stamp with the king's image on it and put it on every piece of paper in the colonist's possession that was an official document. And an official document was defined as a book, a mortgage, a deed, a lease, even a poster one would nail to a tree had to bear the king's stamp. Well, the king was 3,000 miles away. How did he know? if the papers in your possession bore his stamp. Parliament solved that problem for him by enacting the Writs of Assistance Act. This act permitted British soldiers to knock on your door, to write themselves their own search warrant, and to use that self-written search warrant as an instrument to enter your property, allegedly looking for the stamps. Of course, if they found rum that had been imported from the islands that lacked a tax stamp, if they found furniture that had been imported from Great Britain that lacked a tax stamp, if they found anything that might implicate you in some embarrassment or criminal activity about which they knew nothing, when they showed up at your front door, they would seize it and use it to prosecute you. This was the last straw for the colonists, that the British soldiers could write their own search warrants and break down your door and demand to stay to enter your home. By the way, frequently they didn't stay for a couple of minutes or even a couple of hours as FBI agents do today. Sometimes they stayed for weeks and literally lived in your home and required you to feed them. That also was part of the Writs of Assistance Act. We know what happened. We fought a revolution. We won the revolution. We wrote a constitution. In the great debates in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787, there were arguments about where freedom came from. And basically, the arguments fell into two camps. There was the Thomas Jefferson view that freedom comes from our humanity that the default position is freedom, that God created in every thinking adult the desire to be free. And thus, these urgings for freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of travel, freedom of religion, freedom from the government, the right to be left alone, the right to privacy, we all seek these things. They are natural to us, so they come from our humanity which is a gift from God. Alexander Hamilton argued that freedom comes from the government, that without a government we can't be free, and the government decides how much freedom of speech we'll have, how much freedom of religion it will tolerate, how much freedom of movement it will go along with, how much freedom of privacy it will give us. These two schools were at great tension with each other. Jefferson's ideas are best summarized by calling it the natural law theory, the theory that our rights come from our nature. Hamilton's ideas are described today by legal theorists as positivism, meaning whatever the government says is the law, is the law because the government is in charge. That tension between natural law, Jefferson, and positivism, Hamilton, exists even unto today, but was very poignant when the Constitution was written. Hamilton had nothing to do with writing the Declaration. That was written by Jefferson with some assistance from some of his colleagues, but the final draft was Jefferson's. And in that document, it is the greatest defense of natural law liberty ever written because it says that our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are inalienable, meaning they cannot 
be taken away from us because they are part of our nature. The Constitution was written to make sure that those rights would not be interfered with by the government. The whole purpose of the Constitution is to govern the government. The First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. That doesn't grant free speech. That presumes that it pre-exists the Constitution. That presumes that it comes from somewhere else because Madison, who wrote the Constitution and was a good friend and disciple of Jefferson, believed in the natural law that our rights come from our humanity. Think of it. How did the government come about? Did some king gradually grant us liberty? A snippet here, a snippet there, like happened with our cousins in Europe? No. Government came about in this country when we, free individuals, granted power to the government. It wasn't the government letting us exist. It was we giving some power to the government so that it could do what? so that it could preserve freedom. The only legitimate goal of government is to preserve freedom, which is the right of every individual to obey his own conscience and free will, and not the conscience or free will of a bureaucrat or politician who tells us what to do. So the government was about eight years old when under the administration of President Adams it enacted the Alien and Sedition Acts. Adams was the president, Jefferson was the vice president. In those days they didn't run on a ticket. They ran against each other and whoever finished first became president and whoever finished second became, could you imagine that today, and whoever be, finished second became vice president. So you had Adams who was a Hamiltonian, a positivist, believing power came from the government, wanting a big, strong central government as president. And you had Jefferson, an anti-federalist, believing our rights come from our humanity, wanting the government to do as little as possible as the vice president. They didn't have very many cabinet meetings at which they were both present. But the Adams administration succeeds in getting through the Congress the first of the abominable destructions of human liberty enacted by the Congress called the Alien and Sedition Acts. And the Alien and Sedition Acts, among other things, makes it a crime punishable in jail by up to two years to criticize members of the Congress, members of the cabinet, or the President of the United States. Note who's missing. You can criticize the Vice President all you want under the Alien and Sedition Acts. Jefferson, of course, didn't want any of that protection, and he welcomed the criticism. But this was the law of the land. And federal prosecutors in federal courts in the 13 states of the Union prosecuted people. They were tried before juries. They went to jail for criticizing the president or members of Congress because this is the power that the Congress gave itself. Eight years after the Constitution was enacted, 15 years after we fought a revolution, 20 years after the writs of assistance, 25 years after the Stamp Act, we, a free people, electing our representatives, sending them first to Philadelphia and then to Washington, enact a law making it a crime to criticize almost everybody in the government. Jefferson told Adams, if I ever become president, I will never enforce this statute. And it had a time limit on it, and I will never sign an extension of it. Of course, you know what happens. Adams and Jefferson run against each other again. This time, Jefferson wins. Jefferson is elected president, and the Alien and Sedition Acts is up for renewal. Its renewal is proposed in the Congress. By this time, the Congress is controlled by anti-federalists, people who believe in the natural law, believe that, that, that states are sovereign entities, that the federal government can only do the 17 specific things that the Constitution authorizes it to do. 
and the Alien and Sedition Acts expires and dies a well-deserved but ignominious death. We proceed on to the Civil War. Something about war grows the state. When people are afraid that the adversary is going to kill them, they are willing to give the, govern the government extraordinary power they believe to protect them. Even though Abraham Lincoln took an oath to uphold the Constitution, and even though we're all taught in grade school that he is the savior of the nation, that Abraham Lincoln is the Jesus Christ of, of America, he, on his own, locked up over 3,000 northerners who spoke out against the Constitution, against the, uh, the Civil War. He suspended the writ of habeas corpus. The writ of habeas corpus allows you to force your jailer to explain to a judge under what authority he's holding you. But Abraham Lincoln, on his own and without any authority from the Congress, suspended the writ of habeas corpus. Abraham Lincoln sent armies to the South and killed 600,000 people, and the soldiers robbed banks and raped women and burnt courthouses. Where is the power to do that in the Constitution? But the North accepted it because they wanted to win the Civil War. After the Civil War, if you wanted to rebuild your house in Atlanta, which Grant had burnt down, you had to get a permit from Washington, D.C. to rebuild that house to make sure that the government bureaucrats in Washington approved of the way the house was being built and where you bought the lumber and who you were using to build it. Where is that power in the Constitution? Nowhere. During the uh, First World War, Woodrow Wilson arrested people who George Bush would call enemy combatants. They called them anarchists. They were mainly Eastern European Jewish intellectuals. 1,600 of them from Boston to Baltimore were arrested. They weren't allowed lawyers. They never got before judges. They were never prosecuted. They were just kept in jail for the duration of the First World War because Wilson believed that when the country was at war, somehow, mysteriously, from some source, he had the power to lock people up that he thought were a danger to the war effort. But he did persuade the government to enact the Espionage Act of 1917. And the Espionage Act of 1917 says, whoever shall speak out against the government in wartime, whoever shall discourage soldiers from defending their country, whoever shall speak out in favor of those at war with this country, note the words, speak and encourage shall be guilty of a felony. And people were prosecuted. The most famous prosecution is a guy named Benjamin Gitlow. Gitlow couldn't even speak English. Gitlow distributed leaflets on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in Yiddish. And he was prosecuted under the Espionage Act and served 10 years in jail because the government persuaded a jury that he had violated this act. What part of Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech did the Congress in 1917 not understand. I mean, the whole purpose of the First Amendment is to encourage open, wide, robust debate about the great issues of the day, even if the great issue of the day is should we be at war. But if you spoke out against the war during World War I, you were liable to be prosecuted. But Wilson did not make the same mistake as John Adams because the Espionage Act of 1917 had no sunset in it. That is, it didn't expire with the passage of time the way the Alien and Sedition Acts did. Because, my friends, the Espionage Act of 1917 is still the law today. This administration has not chosen to prosecute anyone under it, although former Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez threatened to prosecute the New York Times under the Espionage Act when it revealed on the front pages the day before the Congress was taking a vote to reauthorize the Patriot Act uh, that the government had been spying on Americans without